This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 11, The Loves of King Yayati. Hello, I've been having a hard time putting this episode together. I originally planned it to be like Episode 10, another 30-minute session with some commentary plus around three distinct stories, one on King Yayati, then two more about Krishna's birth and childhood. I've had some trouble with the audio as well as the language. I think maybe there's just too many characters and different details to keep track of for one episode, so I've decided to split it into two shorter episodes. Even if you're familiar with the story already, there are so many characters that it's difficult to keep track of it all. If you have any feelings about what works better, longer episodes with multiple stories or multiple episodes, or anything else that might help me get the story across more clearly, please visit my website and express your opinion. There's no requirement to register if you want to leave a comment, and you can always email me. The site is mahabharatapodcast.com. Thanks for your support. We left off last time with the Pandavas coming out of hiding in a big way. Bhima defeated another ogre. Arjuna defeated a Gandharva, the brothers acquired a house priest, they picked up a wife for the five of them, and they secured powerful alliances with the king of Panchala and Lord Krishna Vasudeva. All five brothers married King Panchala's daughter Draupadi, making her their corporate wife. It wasn't easy convincing him, or us, that having the five brothers marry a single wife was both lawful and a good idea. But the author of the story, Vyasa, stepped in once again, this time to assure us that Yudhishthira and his brothers were making the right decision. Word was quickly spreading that the Pandavas had survived the house fire in Varanavata and were now openly living with the Kuru's powerful enemy in Panchala. Soon, King Dhritarashtra and his sons would find out the news and would have to act on it. But for now, we'll leave our heroes to enjoy their honeymoon and instead get ourselves caught up with the life and career of Krishna, starting with his famous ancestor, King Yayati. As I mentioned before, Krishna's backstory is not mentioned in the Mahabharata. Perhaps the book is big enough as it is, and perhaps they expected their audience to already know about Krishna already. There is, after all, another book dedicated to Krishna's story, which is called the Bhagavata Purana, or the Srimad Bhagavata. I will be depending on a translation of the Bhagavata Purana by Ramesh Menon for the stories and information about Krishna's childhood. What is curious about the current situation is that scholars all agree that the Mahabharata is quite a bit older than the Bhagavata Purana. I can even get a sense of that from the style of writing in the two books. The Mahabharata reads very much like an ancient epic. It is mostly about powerful kings smiting each other and feuds among the gods. The Bhagavata Purana is more like a medieval religious treatise. It is concerned about making arguments in favor of their line of theological thinking. But if the Mahabharata is so much older than the Bhagavata Purana, what did Vyasa expect his audience to know about Krishna? And where did he expect them to find this out? Clearly there's some pieces of the puzzle missing, Perhaps there was an oral tradition or even some other literature that is now lost. If you take the two books on their own terms, however, it makes a little more sense. Remember that the Mahabharata begins with the storyteller Ugrashavas entertaining the Brahmins in the Naimisha forest. He tells them that he just came from a snake sacrifice where he overheard the Mahabharata. The composer Vyasa had instructed his pupil to recite the tale to King Janamajaya. The Bhagavata Purana begins with the same scene. Ugrashavas and the Brahmins in the Naimisha forest. There is no mention whether this is after he's already recited the Mahabharata, or before, or whether this is a completely different episode. But the Brahmins ask him where the story came from, and then ask him to recite it to them. Ugrashavas tells them that the Bhagavata Purana was also composed by Vyasa, and was first recited by Vyasa's son to King Parikshit. Now, the reason Janamajaya was having a snake sacrifice was because his father, Parikshit, had died of snake bite. In this tale, King Parikshit did not resist his fate. Instead, he spent the last seven days of his life in meditation by the Ganges, awaiting death. It is during this period that Vyasa's son, Sri Sukha, recited the Bhagavata Purana. This would all imply that the Bhagavata Purana was revealed before the Mahabharata, so it all makes sense so far. The only detail that makes me uncertain whether I'm reading it correctly is that Ugrashravas describes other retellings over the course of hundreds of years before he got to the Naimisha forest and told it to us. Unless John Majaya was many hundreds of years old, I'm not sure how to reconcile this with the fact that Ugrashravas had just been to his snake sacrifice before telling the Mahabharata. In any case, the best frame to keep in mind for this story would be of a doomed King Parikshit awaiting his death and hearing the story of Vishnu's many avatars leading up to Krishna's life on earth. 
Another important frame for this book is that its composition takes place at the dawning of the Kali Yuga, or Dark Age. This age, in which we, not surprisingly, are in the middle of, technically began on the day of Krishna's death. The one good thing in an otherwise bad situation is that the Kali Yuga is the one time where simple devotion to Krishna, called Bhakti, is all it takes to attain salvation. That is the ultimate theological point of the Bhagavata Purana. Like the Mahabharata, the Bhagavata Purana also starts from the beginning of the universe, but it does it in a much more organized manner. It covers much of the same genealogies and stories, but with slight variations. For instance, the story of Shakuntala and King Parata, which I covered in episode 4, is also in this book, but it comes after the story of Yayati, which makes more sense since Yayati is Parata's ancestor. Yayati is also Krishna's ancestor, so as I promised, I'll cover Yayati's story now. I'm glad I put it off because the Bhagavata Purana version is much clearer and has more details. The story begins deep in the mythical past when the gods and Asuras were still fighting for ascendancy and control of the nectar of immortality. The Asuras had an advising priest or rishi named Shukra. Shukra had a beautiful daughter named Devayani whom he spoiled with his affection. The king of the Asuras, Vrishaparva, also had a beautiful daughter named Sarmishta. These two girls were bathing one day when Lord Shiva came riding by on his bull. The modest girls ran to grab their clothes, and in the confusion, the princess Sarmishta took Devayani's clothes. Devayani was furious that the princess took her clothes, yelling, The audacity of it! You are like a dog eating the holy offerings. We are Brahmins, and through our sacrifices the universe was created. Even the gods honor us. Your father is just a disciple of my father's, and you dare to put on my clothes like a shudra might study the Vedas. Sarmishta was not used to being addressed like this, and replied, You dare talk to me like this? You're like the family's watchdog living off our crumbs. The princess then called on her handmaidens, and they stripped off Devayani's clothes and threw her into a well. Devayani was trapped. At this time, the king of the humans was Yayati, and he was in these same woods while hunting. He grew thirsty and happened by this well. He saw the beautiful Rishi's daughter trapped there naked. He pulled off his cloak and threw it down to her, and then took Devayani by her right hand and drew her out of the well. The traumatized girl fell instantly in love with Yayati, saying, Since you have taken my hand in yours, let no other man take this hand. The Lord Shiva passed this way, and I ended up in a well, so you could rescue me. It is surely fated that we be together. Yayati was uncertain because Kshatriya men were not supposed to wed Brahmin women, but considering her great beauty, he was easily convinced. He had fallen in love with her. Devayani had not forgotten her grudge, however, and she went back to her father and complained about the princess's insolence. The Rishi Shukra must have been fed up over the whole thing because he decided to resign and left in a huff. The king of the Asuras badly needed this Rishi back to help in the war, so he went off in pursuit of his guru. King Vrishaparva prostrated himself before Shukra and begged for his return. Shukra said, Do whatever my daughter asks you to atone for what Sarmishta did. I will not let her shame go unanswered. Vrishaparva readily conceded and turned to Devayani to see what she desired. Devayani said, When I get married, your daughter Sarmishta must go with me as my maid, along with all the handmaids who helped her to humiliate me. Vrishaparva clearly depended heavily on this sage's assistance because he did not hesitate. He agreed that his daughter should become Devayani's servant. Shukra never denied his daughter anything, so he also agreed to allow her to marry the human king Yayati. Just before the wedding, however, he warned Yayati that his daughter was very jealous, and so he had better not even think of having an affair with Princess Sarmishta. Soon enough, Devayani was pregnant. Sarmishta then approached Yayati in private and begged him to have sex with her. Conveniently, Yayati recalled that a Kshatriya's dharma dictated he should never deny a woman of the same caste who desired his favors. And so, despite the sage's warnings, Yayati had an affair with her. Ultimately, Yayati fathered two sons with Devayani and three sons with Sarmishta. Devayani was unaware of his infidelity until one day they passed by Sarmishta's children and the two boys ran to him and called him father. Devayani flew into a rage and went back to her father's home. Yayati was still deeply in love with her, so he ran after her, begging her to return. His father-in-law came out and cursed him. You are a dishonorable and a liar. You are a slave to your lust. I curse you to become an old man at once. Yayati immediately fell at the sage's feet, saying, I am still in love with your daughter. I only gave in to the princess because it was my dharma. Shukra relented, but as with all curses, this one could not be revoked. He said, If you can find someone else to bear your old age, then you can enjoy their youth and vigor until you are satisfied. 
Yayati then turned into a feeble old man. He turned to his sons and asked each of them in turn to trade in their youth, starting with the eldest, named Yadu. Yadu replied, I have only just started to enjoy life's pleasures. How could you expect me to give up my youth so soon? And so, Yayati asked the next eldest, and so on, and was denied by each, until he finally got to his youngest son, named Puru. Puru's response was to say, Of course you may have my youth, father. What gift is too precious in return for the life and body you gave me, which is the only way I will be able to attain salvation? A true son gives his parents whatever they ask of him. He who will not obey his father is not fit to be called his son. Rather, he should be called his excrement. And so, Yayati was returned to his youthful vigor, and his son Peru was left an old man. This lasted for a thousand years, while Yayati enjoyed every pleasure with his lovely wife. During the course of these thousand years, Yayati gradually became jaded with a life of pleasure. He started to give up his desires one by one, and was revolted by sensual pleasures. Yayati explained his feelings to Devayani by telling a story. Yayati told the story of a horny goat who lived in the forest, grazing the lush grass and living free. One day, he heard the bleeding of a female goat, who he discovered had fallen into a well. The billy goat used his horns to dig her out. As he drew her out of the well, he saw that she was very beautiful. They set to rutting directly. He mounted her repeatedly and was never tired of mating. One of the other ewes approached him, and, being a slave to lust, he mounted her as well. When the first ewe discovered what he had done, she left him and returned to her master's house, heartbroken. The billy goat followed her home and bleated piteously, begging her to come back to him. He tried mounting her, but she just butted him in rage. Her owner, a Brahmin, was annoyed by this impudent goat, so he seized a knife and castrated the billy goat. When she saw her lover had been rendered impotent, the ewe began wailing. The Rishi, out of pity for his ewe, used his magic to restore the billy goat's testicles. The two goats then resumed mating and mating and were never satisfied. Yayati said to Devayani, Lovely wife, I am just like that goat, as pathetic as he was. For I have been infatuated with you all these years, thinking only of pleasure and never giving a thought to my soul. Only when a man is unmoved by attachment or enmity does he discover calm and happiness. I have decided I will give up all my cravings and surrender my heart and soul to the Lord. I will leave this place and roam the forest, relinquishing all my vanity. Yayati then went straight to his youngest son Puru and gave him back his youth. He made his eldest four sons each kings of a portion of the realm, but he made Puru the emperor of the whole world. Yayati then departed for the forest to become a sannyasi, or renunciate. Devayani was inspired by her husband's change of heart, and she too took up a life of renunciation. So, King Yayati had five sons, two by Devayani and three by Sarmishta. The eldest, Yadu, was Devayani's son. Thus, he was descended from the Rishi Sukra on his mother's side. Yadu was the ancestor of a line of kings that eventually led to Krishna. Krishna's people are sometimes referred to as the Yadavas or Yadus. Yayati's youngest son, Puru, was the son of Sarmishta. Therefore, he descended from the Asuras on his mother's side. His descendants are called the Paravas, and that line eventually led both to the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Even though Puru was the youngest son, you might say that his descendants are the imperial or senior branch of the family, while perhaps something spiritual or Brahmanic might be read into the descendants of Yadu. As I said at the start of this episode, I'm going to end it here and pick up with Krishna's story next time. I'm also interested in any ideas on how to promote this show. I'd love it if you're to pass the word on, and also let me know if you have any suggestions on how to reach out to people who would be interested in following this podcast. Please visit my website, mahabharatapodcast.com, and leave me a message. Check out my show summaries and a goofy animation I did of Krishna throwing his chariot wheel at Bhishma's head. Thanks for listening.